Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that clarification. Yep. Okay. Well, I'll begin with this. Um, townships have a role in land use decisions. And as solar garden panels and wind turbine blades age, there is a need for sound decommissioning practices. And as we try to do each year, we have our keynote topic and speaker coordinated with our scholarship question. And this year it was, what are the environmental impacts that affect townships? And what are your thoughts as to the sustainable solutions being considered to address this issue? During this past year, our association had the opportunity to visit with MPCA as decommissioning guidelines are being considered. I participated in a decommissioning survey, which was highlighting for model policy potentials. And our website provided links for all of this information. The conversations will continue as we approach our next legislative session, as the issue of appropriate guidelines and solutions impact townships now and will well into the future. Isaac Orr is a policy fellow at Center of the American Experiment, where he writes about energy and environmental issues including mining and electricity policy. He graduated from the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire with studies in political science and geology, winning awards for his undergraduate geology research. I am pleased to introduce Isaac Orr. Hi, and I'm sure there would be a round of applause if everyone wasn't on mute. Uh, Jane, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak tonight. I really appreciate this. Uh, so the title of my talk is called Township Oversight of Emerging Energy Technologies. So I'm going to absolutely be talking about decommissioning, bonding, and environmental impacts, but I also wanted to give, you know, the town board members uh, kind of a 10,000 foot view of these emerging technologies, some of the ways in which uh, other townships are handling them from a permitting perspective. Maybe that's uh, at the beginning where they're talking about um, well, what are we going to do for setbacks? What are we going to do for screening and, and those sorts of things? Because ultimately, they all kind of have an impact on, on the end of life issues. But we'll, we'll definitely get to the meat and potatoes of it. Um, so perfect. Yeah. So if you're not familiar with uh, Center of the American Experiment, we are Minnesota's leading public policy organization. Uh, we specialize in a whole host of different issues. Obviously, I'm energy and environment, but we also have education, labor, the economy, and taxes. Our quarterly magazine, Thinking Minnesota, if you're not signed up for that, it's a free magazine, so you really uh, can't afford not to be a subscriber, uh, goes out to a circulation of 100,000 households, and we aggressively market the materials that we produce. So check out our website at americanexperiment.org if you're interested in learning more. Um, and our organization recently partnered with uh, Robert Bryce, who is a rat, sorry, nationally renowned energy journalist uh, who explores the growing pushback against uh, wind and solar installations in rural America. And by Robert's count, there's already 312 communities across America that have rejected these sorts of installations and more are happening all the time. And part of that's due to the, the things that we're gonna be speaking about here in a little bit. So about me, Jane already gave me the long bio, which always kind of embarrasses me. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I write about all of these things. And I guess the most important thing to know um, from my bio is I grew up on a dairy farm in Wisconsin, uh, which is why I'm very passionate about rural issues like the ones that we deal with on a, a daily basis as townships. And also my dad, uh, that's Mike right there. And that's my mom, Phyllis. Uh, dad was a town chair or supervisor and then a chairman in the town of Wapaka in Wisconsin uh, for more than 10 years. After the constable retired, uh, he assumed those duties too, uh, and he he got interested in running for uh, local office, you know, public service as a, a local official, uh, because in 1999 Wisconsin passed a comprehensive planning law called Smart Growth, and he wanted to have a seat at the table as uh, the town of Wapaka was deciding what their zoning land use would be moving forward, because obviously, you know, if you're a farmer, you have land decisions and you don't want somebody else making them especially if you're a stubborn farmer like my dad. So uh, I'm not, I'm by no means an expert on local township government. I've been to a few meetings and I have like talked to my dad enough about some of the stuff that was happening 
in the town of Wapaka to understand, okay, what's going to be the most relevant information for, for all of you as you, uh, you know, do your job and, you know, you also have day jobs most likely. So um, how can I be of the most help for you? And this is just a quick disclaimer. I'm not a lawyer and nothing I say should be uh, considered as legal advice. I don't know if any of you were Boston legal fans uh, with uh, James Spader and William Shatner, but my dad and I were. Uh, so please consult with your town attorney before implementing uh, any potential policies that we talk about. Um, but I think that these discussions will be worthwhile. So um, what about Bob? Great film, <laughs> Bill Murray at his peak. Um, so the local issues with wind turbines, solar panels, and transmission lines. So you're all familiar with a lot of the issues that we're going to talk about this evening because they're the same issues that you deal with on a daily basis. There's going to be concerns about property rights, uh, property values, noise, impact on roads, long-term impacts. But some of the unique aspects of wind and solar development are height, setback restrictions, shadow flicker, wind rights. Uh, obviously, that's a wind issue, and then decommissioning plans. And uh, I, I'm sure that some of you are at different phases. Some of you already are, are pretty well aware of how this goes in, in your township, but maybe some other townships are just kind of dealing with their first permitting process. So we kind of want to get everybody up to speed. So this was the abstract from my talk. So we're basically going to be talking about how, uh, how the, the regulatory apparatus for townships has shifted over time. And we're going to discuss the environmental challenges coming up. But uh, before we do that, uh, just a quick overview of the talk, 10,000 foot view, if you will. Uh, we're going to talk about the factors driving wind and solar development, things that could cause that development to slow down in the future. Uh, what are the rewards of hosting emerging energy resources in your community? What are the risks? And then we're going to talk about how local governments can mitigate those risks and or protect themselves from liability. Uh, and facilitating the responsible development of wind and solar projects. So what are the drivers? Uh, the drivers have largely up to this date been uh, policy driven, right? So wind and solar uh, installations in Minnesota have grown exponentially since 2007 uh, when Minnesota's Next Generation Energy Act was signed into law. The law requires 25% of Minnesota's electricity come from wind or solar uh, by 2025. And the law was passed in 2013, requiring 1.5% of Minnesota's electricity to come from solar. So we have a state level mandate, and then we also have federal tax credits or subsidies for wind and solar uh, that have been around since uh, 1992 for uh, wind, and I believe a little later for solar. Uh, but these, uh, these installations have also prompted the need for new high voltage transmission lines. So uh, a big driver is obviously policy, and we see that at the federal level as well. Uh, the Biden administration is you know, seeking to extend the subsidies for wind and solar and pay for uh, transmission lines in the infrastructure spending plan. Uh, Biden also wants a carbon-free electric grid by 2035, and 45% of all U.S. electricity to come from solar by 2050. And the Walls administration is also very interested in this. They want to have a 100% carbon-free grid by 2040. But uh, we're also, uh, when, we, when we hear about wind and solar, it's often this very positive view um, that, you know, this is an inevitable shift. It's going to be good for everybody. But, you know, I think that there are, that's kind of an unrealistic look at the future. So um, I, most of the presentations are very rosy. Uh, for me, I think there's two major obstacles that are going to be uh, put in place of this energy transition. And uh, they're physical obstacles and political obstacles. So the physical obstacles are, you know, physics, actually. So um, the main problem with trying to run a grid on wind and solar technology is the, that they only generate electricity when the wind is, or the wind is blowing or the sun is shining. Uh, and electricity, a lot of people think of the grid as a storage device or a giant bathtub that fills up with electricity and you just pull out a pull out some when you need it later, but that's really not how it works. Electricity is uh, used instantly at the moment that it's generated. So it's more like unplugging a lamp. As soon as you unplug the lamp, it's gone, right? So um, that makes it exponentially more difficult to run a grid that's basically dependent on the weather cooperating with your, your demand. So 
This is a graph from the regional grid operator from which Minnesota uh, belongs. And you see that there's a big increase in difficulty from 20 to 30% wind and solar. Uh, and then there's an even larger increase between 30 and 40%. And it keeps getting more difficult as you go towards 50. And this is why California and Texas are having problems keeping their, their lights on. And these are Texas and California are only at about 30% renewable, which means the easy part is behind them. And we see this uh, every day, almost out of California. Uh, the California Independent Systems Operator, which is their regional electric grid, asked the Department of Energy to allow them to basically run their natural gas plants at full capacity, even though that would be violating pollution rules in order to keep blackouts from happening in the state as they are, are worried that they're not going to have enough reliable power plants online in order to provide the electricity that they need. Um, the other, another uh, physical constraint is transmission lines. Uh, the current transmission system is filling up. There's not a lot of extra room for wind and solar. Um, so actually a lack of more transmission is causing some wind and solar projects to get canceled. And they just say, we can't afford to hook this up to the grid. Uh, and studies suggest that we'll need to double or triple the amount of current capacity uh, of transmission lines in order to accommodate more wind and solar onto the grid. Uh, and this is likely to cost hundreds of billions of dollars and take decades to complete. Uh, it takes about 10 years to build transmission lines in the United States uh, when you're going through the whole permitting process. And the last physical uh, constraint that I'm concerned about personally is the short lifespan of uh, wind turbines and solar panels. Um, so a wind turbine lasts for about 20 years and a solar panel lasts 20 to 30 years. And, you know, all, all machines wear out. Uh, although you might not know that, my dad still farms with a Ford 6000 and Ford hasn't made a tractor since the 70s, I believe. So uh, some of them last longer than others. Uh, so uh, natural gas plants, coal plants can last 60 plus years if you maintain them. Nuclear power plants can last up to 80 years, and this means that wind and solar facilities will need to be decommissioned and rebuilt uh, multiple times over that same time horizon in order to keep generating electricity. All right, so let's talk about some of the political obstacles. So I already uh, mentioned this earlier, but uh, local opposition to wind and solar facilities is mounting in rural communities. Uh, these communities cite concerns about property values, diminished view sheds, uh, health impacts, particularly from wind projects. And this makes it even more difficult to build wind turbines and solar panels than policymakers envisioned. And you know, another thing that's happening is electricity prices are increasing dramatically in areas with high levels of renewables. And this includes California, Germany, Spain, and Minnesota. So you have a situation where the reliability of the grid is being challenged in areas with high renewable penetration. And you also have high electricity prices. And um, to me, I think that that puts at risk the, uh, the driving factor behind wind and solar development, which is ultimately a policy goal. All right, so let's, let's weigh the risk and reward though. It's not all bad, right? So uh, the rewards of hosting a, an emerging, emerging energy Technology is obviously local township revenue. Uh, and the challenge or the, the risk is, you know, they can, you know, cause disputes among landowners and potentially cause road or road damage and have uh, substantial decommissioning costs. So you want to be well informed with the risks and rewards. So um, the state exempts wind and solar from normal property taxes, but it applies a production tax in lieu of property tax. So 80% of this revenue goes to the county that's hosting the facility. 20% of it goes to the township or the city. And I've actually created a spreadsheet. I'll get this to Jeff and Jane uh, and Leslie that they can all send out to you if you're interested in uh, using the Microsoft Excel spreadsheet. I'll walk through that on the next slide. But if you have a, a solar facility that's less than one megawatt in size, there's no production tax. But above that, you get $1.20 per megawatt hour, which isn't bad. Um, and then you can see the wind table here. Over 12 megawatts, you have another uh, $1.20 per megawatt hour of electricity produced. So this is, this is the very rough calculator. It's not pretty, but it works. 
Uh, so this estimates that if you had a wind turbine that was producing electricity about 45% of the time, and that would be one of the best producing wind turbines in the state of Minnesota, on average, they produce about 33% of the time, according to federal government statistics. So if you had a better one in your area, the annual township revenue that you could expect to get would be about $95,000. And over a 20 year period, that would be close to uh, $2 million for a 100 megawatt facility, which is a large wind facility. So let's look at a 100 megawatt solar facility, just so we have apples to apples comparisons. Uh, so solar panels, obviously they can't produce any electricity at night and they have a lot less generation output in the winter than they do in the summer because the days are much shorter. So wind turbines only produce electricity about 18% of the time in Minnesota, according to federal statistics. So the township cut from a 100 megawatt solar facility would be about $38,000 or 1.13 uh, over the 30 year lifespan of the 100 megawatt facility. So what are the risks? Um, we have road damage, damage to field tiles, uh, impact on property values for nearby homeowners, uh, safety hazards of damaged turbines and panels, and also decommissioning costs. So uh, I was looking through some of the, the stories in local newspapers, and in uh, Mound Valley, Kansas, there was a situation where a wind developer did not want to, well, basically they'd caused close to $5 million in road damages uh, within the project footprint to township roads. So. Um, you know, we want to be informed consumers. Uh, so local uh, government regulatory powers for townships, you know, for wind, the local townships don't have much say in how things get regulated. Uh, the Public Utilities Commission of Minnesota has the permitting authority for wind projects more than five megawatts. Uh, counties can assume the permitting responsibilities for facilities between five and 25 megawatts, but most of them are bigger than that. So what happens is the, the county gets to set rules that are more strict than what the Public Utilities Commission would otherwise put in. But the townships really have almost no recourse. This is all kind of a, a county level zoning issue, uh, which is, is really too bad because it's the township that's going to be bearing the brunt of the, the externalities that come along with these, um, these energy sources. But for solar, it's the opposite. So. Um, towns have a lot of leeway. Uh, large solar developments, those over 50 megawatts, those are still regulated by the state uh, and they're not bound to local land use regulation, but the PUC does give high deference to such regulations. But for anything less than 50 megawatts for a solar facility, uh, they're reviewed at the local government level, which means that we have a lot of uh, influence and um, say in how the, the permitting process for solar works. I say we, but it's really you. Uh, I am not a local government official, um, but let's let's quickly talk about roads, just because that is one of the the primary responsibilities of uh, a local government, right? I remember my dad having to do a, a roads, you know, drive every uh, once a year usually. But he's like, "Well, are we going to chip seal this one? Or are we going to redo it?" So uh, I I was privy to those conversations and. One of the things to keep in mind is wind turbines are getting bigger and they have heavier components now. And foundations for the largest wind turbines contain up to 1,000 cubic yards of concrete, which is double the amount of more conventionally sized turbines. And vehicle road damage, I'm sure many of you know, doesn't rise linearly with weight. It's actually an exponential relationship. So a 40,000 pound truck does about uh, 10,000 times more damage to roadways than an average car. So you want to keep that in mind because larger, heavier wind turbine components will also do more damage than uh, smaller, lighter ones. Uh, and this is that town in Kansas, or actually, sorry, uh, this is a picture of a um, site in South Dakota, but the quotation is from Kansas. So the wind company in Kansas, they put up a $500,000 bond as part of the road use agreement. And while that seemed like a lot of money at the time, it's not nearly enough when the county is looking at nearly $5 million in road repairs. So uh, what some townships have done is they have put in uh, local use ordinances for all large construction projects that they need to either perform an environmental assessment worksheet or an environmental impact worksheet for the use of the roads. And this has been a tool that they've used in order to kind of keep the, um, the wind developers, you know, make them honor their agreements. So 
Um, in some cases, when developers have decided not to do business in those townships. So you want to make sure that you know, if you don't if you don't want to scare off these wind developers, this probably isn't something that you want to do. Um, but I have the the language for this agreement. It is for uh, the town of Corn is Cornish Township in Minnesota. So um, I'm not going to read this right now because I'm probably already falling behind in my time or my uh, my slideshow. But um, basically, uh, if determining the action is likely to have the potential for significant environmental effects, whether the action is to be um, environmentally or is this will this action be in an area that's environmentally sensitive or uh, aesthetically pleasing whether it will uh, have disruptive impact such as generating traffic and noise um, so those are the the main features of this ordinance but obviously there's two more pages of it that I'm happy to share with you all uh, and then wind projects can't be placed near helipads uh, in some uh, in Michigan some projects were canceled because they were too close to helicopter pads that were being built. And unfortunately, FFA regulations prohibit wind turbines within a certain distance of these helicopter pads. So that's also something if you're looking to get a wind installation in your area, you have to be careful not to put a helipad there as well. Um, so, but for solar, uh, we, have, we have a little bit more um, leeway, <laughs> I will say. Uh, to, to implement rules that right size the, the developments, right? So we'll look at three different types of ordinances. And, you know, I just want to have a disclaimer right now. I'm not the, the end all be all expert of permitting these things. Uh, I've talked to experts throughout the country, uh, Kevin Martis in Michigan, Christy Rosenquist in, uh, in Minnesota, and um, God, I forget the guy's name in North Carolina, and I feel bad about it. But uh, I've got draft ordinances from each of, uh, from the city of Hugo in Minnesota, uh, and then draft ordinances from North Carolina and Michigan, and I'll make sure to, you know, supply the town's association with word documents of these three. So uh, the other thing I want to say, start this off with, there are definitely good uses for solar panels, or it has appropriate uses and locations, uh, and it's, you should permit it in these areas, and especially when it's a smaller solar energy facility, is going to be providing electricity to the um, the area or the 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 building that it's on, right? So I think that you don't want to have a, a solar restriction that is so strict that you can't do some of these things because you want to honor people's property rights. Um, but when it comes to larger installations, you have to you know kind of make a, a bigger consideration there. So. Setbacks. Um, some cities only require setbacks that are in, accordance, are in accordance with local zoning. The city of Hugo says solar farms should be 50 feet from all property lines and public right of ways. Um, North Carolina, uh, so they actually re require all structures and fencing associated with the solar facility should be a minimum of uh, 250 feet setback. And then um, in Michigan, large solar facilities should be set back 500 feet from all lot lines and public road right-of-ways or district setbacks stated in the underlying zoning district, whichever is greater. Uh, in addition, large solar facilities <clears throat> and other structures must be located at least 500 feet from all existing residential or commercial district land and existing residences at the time the solar farm is granted conditional use per permits. Uh, in addition, these structures should not be located within 50 foot of a drain easement or uh, in Michigan, they say, alternatively, one can insert a 2,500 foot setback to unleash property lines that can be waived by the developer acquiring an easement from a neighboring landowner. So you wanna be flexible with people. If you have neighbors that don't mind that it's closer than uh, 2,500 feet, then you know that's their property, right? To say, yeah, that's fine. Um, density, and I wanna thank Carl Friedrichs for reaching out to me. He had a bunch of questions and I thought, well, if Carl has them, probably a lot of other people do. So let's let's answer these to the best of my ability. Uh, so uh, when we talk about density restrictions, what are the pros and cons? Well, obviously uh, they're a double-edged sword, right? So allowing more solar panels per acre will increase the profitability of the installation, while having fewer panels will reduce the attractiveness of the investment. Uh, in Michigan, uh, on land that is zoned as agriculture, they have a maximum lot coverage ratio of 10%. So if you had 100 acres, you could only put solar on 10%. So um, that sounds, you know, uh, when I was speaking with Kevin about this, he said, well, you know, this is zoned agriculture. And really, when you're talking about a large 
solar facility, one that's you know over one megawatt, you're you're really looking at something that's a little bit more of an industrial facility, and it's more appropriate to do it uh, in a, an area zoned industrial. So I thought that was interesting. Um, so uh, as far as screening goes, a lot of areas have ordinances that say, look, you know, you can build this, but you have to have screening. Uh, City of Hugo says they should be enclosed by a perimeter fence or adequate vegetative buffer for screening. Uh, you know, exceptions can be made if you, if you need them. Uh, in North Carolina, this one is um, a little bit more stringent. They said a 100 foot uh, buffer, the buffer yard shall be continuous vegetative screen buffer designed by a North Carolina licensed landscape architect or a contractor approved by the zoning administrator. Uh, and the visual buffer should have at least 80% opacity to a height of 10 feet. Within four growing seasons, the vegetation shall comply with the zoning ordinance. And in Michigan, um, they say the screen should consist of shrubbery, trees, other non-invasive plants uh, that provides a visual screen. At least 50% of plants must be evergreen trees, which should not be less than six feet at the time of planting. In lieu of planting trees, a decorative fence with at least 50% opaque may be used, and some jurisdictions are requiring earthen berms. So just to kind of get a feel of what's happening in other parts of the country, uh, in North Carolina, they recommended a six-foot high fence should be installed at all major ground-mounted solar systems to prevent damage and vandalism, prevent trespassing, and provide for safety and security. Uh, and then they, of course, they said no, uh, no fencing is required for the smaller roof-mounted uh, facilities. Um, they also have noise abatement. So uh, wind turbines generate uh, noise when the wind or when the blade is passing the uh, turbine foundation. But for solar facilities, it's the inverters that cause noise. So uh, I haven't been around one when it's making the noise. I watched a video one time, and that was not very. Uh, pleasant, but you know, unlike a wind turbine, a solar facility, you have the option to mitigate the noise. Uh, so you can do that with different walls. Uh, so 40 decibels have been, you know, cited as a reasonable limitation uh, for a quiet rural area. Um, so uh, the height of the mount. Uh, so uh, in Hugo, they said 15 feet. In Michigan, they said 14 feet. And in North Carolina, they said, you know, it should not exceed 20 feet in height. Uh, and again, if it feels like I'm rushing through all of this, I, I am, so I apologize. Uh, but all of this stuff will be available for you to review, and I'm happy to answer any questions that uh, you may have at the end, which is another reason why I'm, I'm moseying along here. Uh, field tiles. So this one was interesting to me. Um, we farmed a blow sand that the glacier left at our farm, so we never had to worry about not having enough drainage. But um, so in Michigan, they don't have that problem, and they wanted to make sure that existing drain tile uh, was inspected by a robotic camera, and the imagery was submitted to a local township to make sure that there was a good baseline for the tile. Uh, any repairs should be documented. Um, yeah, so any damage or inoperable tile should be repaired prior to construction, and such repairs shall be documented in a report submitted to the landowner. So. Uh, basically, while the uh, solar facility is in operation, uh, the tile should be inspected every three years. If there's a tile failure, it should be fixed within 60 days, um, and they should have to submit that to the, um, let me just make sure I am changing my chat to everyone so I'm not missing any questions. Uh, and then uh, support should be constructed to preserve any drain tiles. And the, the, the main reason for this is, you know, if you get a a situation where the farm reverts to a wetland status because of a failed drainage tile, you can't farm that land anymore. And if you can imagine 30 years from now when a project ends and all the fields are wet, the developer's defense is going to be, well, uh, how do you know the tile worked from the beginning? So, you know, we take baseline um, environmental measurements when we, you know, permit a mine. It makes sense to do that when we do it for uh, other energy facilities as well. All right, on the road again, uh, solar panels are generally less heavy than wind turbine components. They require less concrete and then they have less impact on the roads. Uh, although enacting an ordinance that will have industrial, let's see here, that I, I might've worded that weird. It, it still probably wouldn't hurt to have the EAW or EIS ordinance in place to make sure that, you know, they're doing their due diligence when it comes to uh, maintaining the roads. So 
Uh, this, is a, this was an interesting one, uh, property value guarantees. I used to write a lot about industrial sand mining, crack sand mining, sand and gravel mining. And there were situations where people were worried that those would impact property value. So the, you know, the mine developer either bought out the neighbors or gave them a property value guarantee. In Michigan, they kind of did the same thing. And you know, solar developers say there's little risk to solar arrays in the neighborhood. And if that's the case, awesome. Uh, then they probably shouldn't have a problem guaranteeing it. Um, so a developer shall offer a property value guarantee acceptable to the township that will make solar array neighbors whole financially in the event that the proximity to solar scale development is harmful to residential property values. This shall be made available to all property owners within one mile of the project boundary. And now we're going to get to what Jane was talking about. So I'm sorry I made you wait uh, this long, but I just felt that it was important to have a good baseline. Uh, environmental impacts and bonding. So all energy sources have an impact on the environment. Everything that humans do has an impact on the environment, whether that's mining, manufacturing, or tourism. And the, the main thing that we want to do is make sure that we are making the best informed decisions to where we can maximize benefits and minimize risks, right? So many people consider wind turbines and solar panels to be green, but they also present their own unique challenges, and these need to be um, dealt with, and they're most often dealt with during the operations and decommissioning phases of these projects. So for wind, um, wind is made, or sorry, wind turbines are made with basically chemically inert materials, right? So it's fiberglass, steel, copper, and cement. So you're not going to have a chemical risk uh, as a result of a wind turbine. Um, but the, in most of the metal, the steel and the copper is recyclable. However, the wind turbine blades are not recyclable and they're often shipped to landfills uh, when wind turbines reach the end of their useful lives, which can be 20 years. Some of them are being decommissioned or repowered uh, after 10 years. Excel Energy is doing some of those. Uh, but for me, from a local town uh, township level um, land use planning perspective, it's the foundations. So, uh, you know, we we're talking about 1,000 tons of concrete or cubic feet, sorry, of um, tons would be crazy, uh, of concrete for these wind turbine bases, and a, a smaller one is about 300. So you have 300 cubic feet of concrete underground, and these wind companies are only required to remove the first four feet of concrete and cabling, and the rest of it remains underground forever. So, um, you know, that probably is fine if you're going to be farming on this land after the, the wind turbine uh, installation is decommissioned, but if you want any other land use, then this may present problems down the road. So, I mean, obviously this is a county issue, not a town issue, but it, I've wanted you all to be aware of it. Um, so when it comes to the environmental challenges associated with solar panels, uh, they also have collection lines, concrete, and those should all be removed when the project is done. Uh, and that's to preserve future property values. Uh, solar panels do contain heavy metals like cadmium and lead, and academic research has found that these metals can leach out of broken panels over the course of months uh, with rainwater because it's naturally acidic, uh, slightly, not a lot. You're not going to have, your rain barrel is fine, just know that it's slightly acidic. Um, so solar panels are mostly glass, which is a low valuable recyclable material, which is why you only get about $3 in value for each panel that you recycle. Uh, but on the other hand, it costs about $20 to $30 to try and recycle the solar panel. So it's not economically feasible, especially when it only costs $1 to $2 to landfill it, uh, which is why, as a result, a lot of times they're either shipped to a landfill or they're shipped to third world countries for reuse and disposal. And that's why a lot of the academic research about, uh, well, can the heavy metals leach out of these solar panels is being conducted in India. Um, so this is uh, an academic paper. I, it might be the same New York um, decommissioning study I'm going to cite here in a few minutes, but uh, managing the waste stream has the potential to be challenging because of the hazardous metals. Uh, these issues will arise at the end of a project's life or if it's rendered unusable by high winds, hail, or other damage. And if not properly disposed of, these materials may cause risks to the environment or human health although existing research suggests that risks are relatively modest. And I think that's right. I think the risks are, you know, pretty modest because the, um, you have to be exposed to these toxins in order for them to, you know, it's the dose that makes the poison, right? 
So I don't think that we're going to have um, that large of an issue with solar panels if we make sure that we're uh, dotting our dotting our I's and crossing our T's. Uh, uh, some facility or some municipalities are exploring uh, requiring the use of geomembranes underneath the solar facilities to collect stormwater runoff, uh, which would, you know, in theory, protect uh, groundwater supplies from heavy metals that might leach out of broken panels. Uh, this could be paired with a you know, requirement to treat stormwater runoff at a waste treatment facility, but I think this would be a huge disincentive to build the solar facility. They would probably look uh, to go somewhere else with their, their installation. Um, so bonding, this one's big. Um, this is very big. And the motto is get the money up front. Um, it's, it's a lesson to live by for a, a lot of things. But uh, so solar panels last for 30 years at most. Uh, but the Harvard Business Review states that many solar panel owners could start replacing their panels as soon as 10 years after their installation. And that's going to greatly increase the amount of solar waste that is going to be accumulating. So many wind and solar companies, uh, you know, are shell companies, for lack of a better word, that exist to protect larger companies from liability. Um, and then there are some times when they say like, oh, well, you know, we're going to put up a bond, but we're going to subtract the amount of scrap metal that we think we're going to be able to, you know, get back from, from the bond, and then we'll pay you with that later. I would say, no, <laughs> I would say, you know, you got to pay it all up front. And then if there's uh, scrap metal value that comes back, you're welcome to have it. Um, and there's also a, a situation where developers usually seek to be exempt from paying into the bond fund for a period of years, usually five to 10 years, and then they start paying into the decommissioning fund. I would say get it up front um, because you don't know how long this facility is going to be operational and uh, you wanna make sure that you're protected. So the cost of decommissioning solar panels. Uh, this is from a report filed in New York. And basically what it boils down to a uh, one megawatt, decommissioning one megawatt of solar costs about $30,000. So this says two megawatts for 60, so easy to do the math. But let's look at that 100 megawatt solar facility that we talked about earlier in terms of tax revenue. Uh, it would generate about 1.139, I believe, in tax revenue over the first three years. The decommissioning cost for that facility would exceed $3 million. So uh, make sure that when you are doing your, your decommissioning requirements up front that you get that up front. Otherwise, you could be in the hole rather than ahead as a result of the project. So uh, this is from the um, Michigan ordinance. So talking about the cost of decommissioning, it's important to have escrowed funds for code enforcement as well. Uh, liability insurance does not cover code enforcement, and those actions are a township expense. So you do not want to be in a situation where you as the township have to go out of pocket to, you know, make sure that wind and solar developers are honoring the terms of their agreement because they probably have more money than you do. And if you have to make a decision between do we refinish this road, do we plow the roads, or do we sue this company and hope to get this money back? It's it's a really bad situation to be in as a, as a town supervisor or chairman. So uh, this ordinance, I'm going to read it because it's important. Uh, the owner and operator of the solar farm shall post a security bond or escrow or irrevocable letter of credit in a form acceptable to the township equal to 125% of the total estimated decommissioning, code enforcement, and reclamation costs. The cost of decommissioning shall be reviewed between the operator and the township board every two years to ensure adequate funds are allocated for decommissioning. The security bond or escrow or irrevocable letter of credit defined herein shall be appropriately adjusted to reflect the current decommissioning estimate. This security bond or escrow or irrevocable letter of credit shall be issued by a third party and paid third party and paid by the operator. All right, benefits and costs. That's what we want to do. We want to minimize the, the risks to the township while maximizing the benefit. That means that as a town board, you should have at least $3.75 million in bonding in the reclamation account to ensure that landowners and local governments are not left footing the bill for cleanup. 
uh, one solar facility in Dodge County, Minnesota. I was talking to Representative Brian Daniels about this, and I didn't get a chance to follow up with his contact, but he said that the the it was the municipality or the county or the township. I'm not sure which one it was, uh, but they had the solar facility put up a bond for twenty thousand dollars, and then they had an external assessment come out and say it would be a three hundred thousand dollar cleanup. So I don't want any of you on this call to be in a situation where you guys are two hundred and eighty thousand dollars short. Um, that's that's the road plowing budget, and then some in in a lot of areas. So. It's important to weigh the potential rewards against the potential costs, obviously. Uh, and if it sounds too good to be true, it might be. And I'm not saying it is, but it uh, it could be. Um, in Europe, they're requiring uh, solar bonding. So basically they're saying, look, growing solar waste is a problem. We don't want this in our landfill because if it is going to be breaking in the landfill and leaching heavy metals, we don't wanna have that potential liability down the road. Some states actually treat uh, solar panels as hazardous waste. You have to take them to a special landfill. And uh, there's actually growing pushback against that because there's a lot of solar panels that are now starting to reach the end of their useful lifetime. And uh, the people who are trying to get rid of them didn't understand at the time that if they are characterized this way, that there's going to be restrictions on how you can transport them and it's going to be costly. So. There's, there's going to be some friction there for a while. Uh, we'll, we'll probably figure it out. But uh, in Michigan, it says the um, draft ordinance says developers shall furnish an assurance in the form acceptable to the township that guarantees that 100% of PV panels and attendant electrical apparatus wiring metal support structures shall not enter the waste stream. Obviously, this is going to have an impact on the size of the uh, upfront bond because it costs a lot more to recycle solar panels than they are you know, ultimately worth. So um, if, I know I, I talked about transmission lines a little bit earlier, but got away from that uh, throughout the, the course of the report, but transmission lines for wind and solar are going to be a much larger, bigger deal moving forward, um, just because they say you're gonna need two to three times more transmission lines than currently exist in order to facilitate a grid that's largely powered by wind and solar. And uh, the transmission lines are mostly built to connect wind turbine facilities to uh, distant uh, population centers. So we have, a, we have a mismatch of supply and demand for electricity. The supply of wind is best in North and South Dakota, whereas the electricity that people want to use is in Minneapolis, St. Paul, usually. So the the act of transmitting that, I mean, a transmission line is essentially a highway, right? Um, so the transmission, the wind turbines require a lot more transmission than other sources because they're so far away. Uh, and most of the wind projects that new Minnesota companies are building are in the Dakotas. So my question is, what, what recourse does the town have or the county have if these transmission lines suddenly aren't being used because we've decided that you know, maybe the um, the downsides of wind do not outweigh the upsides. So I, you know, in areas like Texas and North Dakota, they have a history of orphaned oil wells where, you know, the, uh, the oil company went broke and they didn't do a good job of cleaning up their, um, their mess when it comes to, you know, the oil and gas development. But we could see a situation where there's orphaned wind, so or wind, solar or transmission projects. So uh, the, the reclamation and the bonding is, is absolutely important. So uh, like I said, the, the ordinance I referenced will be available uh, to you to download and use as you see fit. Uh, Excel spreadsheet for those of you who are, who are savvy with that. Uh, and these slides are free for you to use and share with anybody you would like to, who you think might be interested. Uh, if you enjoyed this presentation, uh, please visit AmericanExperiment.org and make a tax-deductible donation to help fund our work. We're a, you know, we're an educational organization. Uh, most of our donors are individual Minnesotans. I think something like 25 or 20 to 25 percent of our people, are, our donations come from people who give us less than a thousand dollars. So we're really a grassroots organization, 